conversation. And um, once again, we're just so excited to have you guys. We also have some of our panel speakers on the line early on. So that's pretty cool too. Um, and so you have access to these advocates um, and women powerful uh, folks doing awesome things. Um, right at your fingertips, right at your fingertips because you logged on today, okay? That's not what I wanted to do. Okay, so, we have, we're going to go ahead and get started with the slide deck. Oh, I see a few more. Did I give a shout out to UMass Boston? I see that you're in the house today. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We got folks from everywhere. Texas, ATL, San Diego, Chicago, Cali, DC. Man, we are in the house today. Whew. I'm just too excited about us being here and getting fired up. I want to gauge the room. Man, it's so difficult that we're back in person. So I want you guys to let us know, how do you feel about in-person classes now that you guys are back in the classroom experience? <laughs> How's that going? Are you feeling like, oh, oh my God, oh my God, I can't deal with this? Or are you kind of like, man, or are you like Oprah and you like feel like a million bucks? Like I feel like a million bucks. Like, yes, I'm back with my people. My tribe is here. I'm in person. I'm in a mask, but I'm in person. <laughs> How are you guys feeling? Anyone want to go off mute and tell us how you feel? Anyone want to raise your hands? So everyone is loving being back in person. Everyone. Oh. Oh, I was just going to say, um, I don't know if you're asking, I'm not in school, so I don't know. I hope y'all are doing good with the in-person thing. I was just going to say, I'm feeling good today and, and ready to be here and I'm fired up to be here. Um, and just want to share that with the group because I'm really excited and I would love to hear some of y'all. Uh, I feel like I can always engage better when people are off mute. So don't be scared y'all. I feel like it's a good group. So I also wanted to say that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. And some of the messages in the chat are that yeah, yeah, two right now. I'm okay. I'm all right. Uh, four. Um, it is kind of scary. So definitely true. Um, Christina, Christina, are y'all mute? Yes, can y'all hear me? Definitely. Okay, cool. I was gonna say, you know, I love being in person for everything but class, but the whole remote <laughs> class thing is just not my cup of tea. Oh, I mean, the whole in person class thing is not my cup of tea. You don't want to be in person. You want to just be virtual. Oh, I love it. I miss sleeping in the bed. Not like <laughs> not having to get ready for school. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, I love it. I love it. Well, thanks guys for sharing. It sounds like a three. It sounds like kind of 50-50. People are like, woohoo, back in school because I can see my friends and colleagues. But everyone's kind of like, eh, it's back to school. Back to school. Thanks, guys. Thank you for participating. Like, yes. 
So with anything, we like to go ahead and share ground rules about um, what's going to be going on and just explain to everyone. I want to remind you guys that you need to be present. We need to be present while we are being a part of this fabulous experience. Um, You want to make sure that you can remove all your distractions that you may have. Um, We understand that you may have a little people like Aiden here, my son. <laughs> you may have cool pets. You may have mom, dad. Who knows who's around? Uh, partners around, just all up in your screen. But if you can, try to remove all distractions. Go to a, a room or a space that you can sit down, relax, and just get all this good information into your pores, baby girls. It's your pores, and we're going to have to have a good old time. So get you a beverage, get you a coffee. I got my coffee. Coffee, got my Dunkin' Donuts. Uh, if you are, uh, if it's the afternoon, get you a glass of wine. We not gonna judge. It's Saturday, baby. <laughs> get something that you guys can take some notes down. Um, and so, if you use your iPad, if you use your phone, um, little uh, anything make sure that you write down some notes because you're going to get so much good information from these fellows. Like you just heard from Jess, um, like Carolyn, you will hear like, this is what you will need to do to get into politics, right? And once you guys have in, center yourself, get grounded and just take all of this information in because we're here to support you. We are here to get you fired up because this is Ignite. And so take everything in. If you got questions, put them in that chat box because we're here to answer them um, privately and or to the large group because every question is important um, because someone on this line is like, man, I really wanted to answer, ask that question, but you asked it first. So how awesome is that? We all get the information out. Okay. So those are our ground rules. Just continue to be present. Then when it comes to just getting order um, into our space, we want to make sure that you rename yourself. So make sure that you hover down in the rename area, add your pronouns, and then put what college chapter and or location you're from. So example, you see mine, I am Tari Strickland. I am in Chicago and I'm with Ignite National. So who are you? If you would like to add your pronouns, feel free. She, her, they. Um, whatever your choice. Go ahead and rename. Just so that we know who you are in this present space, we identify you correctly. Okay. And again, welcome. If you just got on, my name is Tari and I am the Midwest Director. And I have the pleasure, 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 pleasure of welcoming you all to the Ignite Movement of young women who are ready and eager to become the next generation of political leaders. Can I get a hand clap for that? that's what's up so (laughs) welcome guys and we're going to play a small video so get ready because no one will tell me that i can do this they tell us now we can hear it can you go ahead and rewind yes i will thank you see Technology, we got an all-star team in the house. <laughs> Thank I'm you. President. When I'm 13, I won't anymore. Because no one will tell me that I can do this. They tell me other things like, don't raise your hand so much. Wait your turn. Let the other kids answer. Be a good girl. They'll joke that I'm bossy. Instead of telling me that I'm a leader. So I'll give up. But if grown-ups, like my mom and dad, grandpa and grandma, and even my teachers, just told me that I belonged here, I would believe them. I know if I run for office someday, I can win just like any boy. 
I want to be a mayor, a governor, a senator, a president. Tell me I can, and I will. I just love that video. Do you guys feel fired up? Are you feeling like, oh yeah, Ignite is gonna provide me. Yes, Jess, Ignite is gonna provide me with that toolkit because no dream is too big here. Because of Ignite, you have awesome women in leaders women leaders, women in leadership that are going to be here to support you throughout this process. And it all starts here. It starts in your college chapters. You're doing so many awesome things. And we want you to know that you belong here. You belong here. No doubt there are no other organizations like this one that are run by some who? Some minority women, some women of different cultures, women who are here to support the next stage in the movement. And that next stage in the movement is starting with you guys. You guys are going to be the ones that protect, take care, get us organized, and to be real, to fight for us, to fight for citizenship. So we're so glad that you're in the room and in the space getting fired up. Okay. So why are we here today? Anyone want to come off mute and say why they're here today? So I'm going to tell y'all why y'all here today. Y'all are here today because your community needs you. Whatever community, whatever culture you all identify with, is it African-American culture? Is it mother's culture? As I have mine right here on my hip. Is it education? Um, is your community your Greek group? What community needs your support now to be educated so that the next phase in politics looks like who? our community, because we are the community. So we need you to gain these tools so that you can be that need. You can be that person that um, is just gonna be that team leader for our future in the community, okay? What our agenda looks like today is one, we have a panel with community centric. I want you to look at that, feel that, be that community centric because that is huge, 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 huge. Um, we not just focus on women organizers, but we want to focus on the you and community, making sure that the focus is on the world around us, making sure that we are doing things that advocate for that community, okay? Two, five steps to community leadership. What is that going to look like? And our fellows kind of have some cheat sheets because they've been going through this and training for a little while. And then we want you guys to find ways to get involved. And we want to help you through that because I know you guys have some ideas about how to get involved. I see in the chat box, just, just share with us um, the website. So click on our website so you can get fired up too. Okay, introductions. What is your name? What city are you from? And one thing in your city you want to change. So I wanna to get to know you. I want to make sure that our group gets to know each other. So, I who wants to start us off? Are there in, and my child is singing uh, some special song. <laughs> I, uh, okay. 
anyone want to share first or what what we're going to do it's a small group so um to get a few of us off of mute i'm just going to jump in i'm going to say who i am where i'm from and then i'm going to call out a name and then just keep it going popcorn style okay so my name is Tari Strickland. I am originally from St. Louis, but I'm in Chicago. One thing I want to change is I want to make sure that women of color see themselves in political places by providing them with the tools, whether that is books, whether that is education, whether that is just me blabbing and getting them ex excited. <laughs> so I'm going to popcorn it over to Barbara Reyes. Um, so see, let me see if I can put Hi, Barbara. Hi. <laughs> so my name is Barbara and, um, so I currently live in, well, I'm originally from Austin, but I live in College Station because I go to Texas A&M. And one thing I would want to change in my city is probably, um, uh, definitely, I, guess I just had it in my head, but yeah. Um, I guess working on making it more. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, I would say to make it more diverse. Well, I'm specifically talking about my school um, and being able to, again, um, let others. Let, let other people know that like, you know, haven't been around like diversity and all that stuff, you know, um, appreciate it more. Um, Cause for me, luckily, like when I grew up, well, I, look, I grew up in a low income community. So I've always been around minorities. And so, you know, going to Texas A&M, it was a culture shock. And um, so even before, like I was in Ignite, I was in programs or an organization that promoted diversity. And that was really fun. And um, I hope to continue doing that work. Um, and I'll go ahead and pass it on to um, is it Zana? I don't know. I'm sorry if I mispronounced it. It's Zana. All right. Um, my name is Zana. I live in Baltimore, Maryland. And one of the main things I want to change in my city is I want to. Uh, I want to inspire Black women to um, take their health more seriously and inspire us culturally to get into fitness culturally to get into and to um, just improve our relationship culturally with health because uh, we're like, it's a very low percentage of us that value fitness culturally. Like we don't really have this cultural norm normative of um, fitness or health or nutrition. So that's one of my main goals. And I want to popcorn it to Carolyn. Hi. Yeah, so I am from uh, specifically Garland, which is basically Dallas. It's just a little bit outside of Dallas. And so I'm going to be speaking for the DFW area as a whole. I think the main thing that I want to change, and that's why I'm really involved with Ignite, is that we don't really educate our young women on politics the same way we do with our, our young boys. Like, it's almost like we think of boys as like just primed to be politicians and in government and in that space, but women, it's not really for them. And so I feel like if I can just hack on that a little bit and change the space and make it so women are more included and we, we open those doors for them so that they can see themselves in those roles. That's that's what I want to do, and that's why I'm here. So I love it. thank you, Carolyn. We have time. For
it looks it looks like Tari's um, audio is going out. Uh, but what she's trying to say is we have time for one more volunteer. Um, anyone else would like to come off mute and share? And then everyone else, you can just drop your introductions into the chat box for us. Um, <clears throat> I'll go. My name's Olivia and I'm from Austin, but specifically the St. Edwards chapter. And um, I would really like to like change the power that uh, like voters and just citizens have in Austin to make change and like more power given to like the city council and the people who speak for our citizens just like kind of changing the dynamic and making it so that like citizens voices are heard rather than just like the legislators and the congress people <laughs> in their own opinions. I appreciate that, Olivia. And I think that is in a lot of alignment of why we're here um, today and the essence of what it means to be a community centric leader in practice, but also a representation of voice um, and less about being the voice of people, but empowering people to be their own voice. Um, Truly appreciate that. And thank you all for your patience. You know, in this virtual reality, <laughs> technology is not always on your side. So um, I'm gonna keep us going while we wait for Atari to join us. And if you haven't already, go ahead and drop your introduction in a chat. Um, we love reading those and we truly appreciate you spending this time on your beautiful Saturday with us here today. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and go to the next slide. And the first question that we have for you all, and if you can engage with us in the chat box, what does a community centric leader look like to you? I think really in this country, um, when people think of leadership in general, it's like this one image, a lot of times that pop up in people's faces. Um, and what I think that we have to do is start re-socializing what leadership actually looks like. And so I'm curious, when, we, when we're talking about community-centric leadership, what does that look like to you? What does it feel like, sound like? And you can drop that in the chat box or if you're feeling froggy, jump and come off mute <laughs> and you can say it to us verbally. Hi, Jesse. It's nice to see your face. I'm gonna pick on you for a second though. Um, what, what does community-centric leader, uh, what does a community-centric leader look like to you, Jesse? I was just typing in the chat. It's good to see you too when I saw you on the call. I'm like, oh, yeah, in the room. <laughs> Um, so hi everyone, my name is Jesse. I'm the Denver Fellow. Um, to me, I think a community-centered leader is someone who, um, well, in my perspective, like puts their privileges on the line, puts their experiences to the forefront and advocates based on that, but also works to uplift and encourage the stories of others in their community, um, empowering multiple generations to like bring up these issues and, and propose solutions. Um, so I think it's standing yeah, like- issues with the people um instead of like just like you're the forefront you're the face i think also standing alongside um a lot of people and bringing up bringing up their leadership so it's not all on you to take care of all the issues um yeah that's i think that's how i see it i love that and i what i really felt from you when you were saying is something i hold dear to my my heart this idea that we hold um and sometimes a rhetoric that continues to show up in some of our environments is the idea of like taking up space um or even measuring the success of our leadership to the white male standard and because they take up so much space um, the way that we choose to empower each other is by take up space, take up space. But what it, what I really heard you saying is like, how do you actually 
hold space and to take it one step further how you actually create space because I think that's exactly what we need to get away from is this idea of taking up so much space and we create space and hold space for others so thank you for sharing that uh, well we're going to go ahead and jump into our panel and unfortunately Quadira had an accident um, and will not be able to join us um, but I'm super excited to be in this virtual space uh, with Zaina Allen um, and Mary Black, who I'm going to give the opportunity to really introduce themselves. And really the idea behind this panel is how do you take everyday people who are doing the work and re-socialize our ideas about what leadership looks like and put a community-centric approach on there. So it doesn't mean that you have to be wearing like a power suit. It doesn't mean that your hair got to look a certain way, that you have to be from a certain background, that you have to have a certain type of degree. It's really getting about that business and the sweat equity of how you get into the trenches with your community. And these are two people who are about that business. And I'm excited to have them come pour into you all and share a lot of the wisdom them, and not only in the journey of where they are and how they got here, but where they plan to go. So let's just go ahead and jump right into it um, with introduction. So I would love for us to take the time um, and start with Zaina, if you could just introduce yourself um, and what you want to bring into this space today with these young women. All right, hello again, everybody. I'm Zaina Allen. And to Jesse point, everything you said about walking with the people, that's exactly how I live my life. I embody my life. Like there is no, there is no social change or no social improvement or connection with, with anybody if you don't want to walk with them. So I really appreciate you saying that. Um, but I am, I consider myself a community-led grassroots activist. I basically am a herbalist. I'm a six-year practicing herbalist. I delve deep into the esoteric arts. Um, I have my own botanical business where I sell Af African centered um, spiritual like tools, like candles, all sorts of stuff. Professionally on the um, resume, I am a, a program coordinator for this organization called Our Minds Matter. Um, it's a teen led suicide prevention organization where we provide resources and activities for them to use at their school site. So we inspire them to be um, mindful and help them with mental health um, resources basically. Mm -hmm. um, what I want you all to really gain from this space is the comfort of you don't have to have it all on paper to get the job done. You don't have to have connections to get the job done. And you have to be willing to fix the personal parts also in order to like be the change. So it's one thing to say you want to stand for a cause and stand for an issue, then have background troubles in your own personal life, like allow yourself to wear the, the work, allow yourself to hold yourself accountable and fix those relationships and be forgiven and open your mind. So mm -hmm. lose that pressure of figuring it out the moment you graduate and basically be okay with creating your space as in what Tierra said, like stop looking for opportunities and create opportunities for yourself. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Zaina. Am I on mute? No, I'm, I'm not on mute. And what came up for me when you said that one of my biggest life lessons is that self-care is a revolutionary act. My ability to prioritize myself, my physical, my mental, my spiritual is a revolutionary act because the way that we have been conditioned in this country is to be machines, to be slaves, to be servants, and to not prioritize ourselves. And so... Thank you for sharing that with the people. Mary Black. Wow, that was amazing. Um, hey, everybody, I'm actually going to work backwards um, just because I want to piggyback off of what was said. My name is Mary Black. Uh, I really have been diving into this idea of rest being a revolutionary and radical act as well, just because, you know, our ancestors weren't granted that. So just the type of self-care and the self-work it takes to come into community spaces and be organizers and like holding yourself accountable for developing the changes in yourself so that you can create changes in your community. I think that is something that I really mm -hmm. want to stress and like how all the different ways that comes in for whatever, however you want to show up and understanding yourself and the work that you do so that we can all be better catalyst for change. So I think that's what I'm hoping everybody gets out of like our panel discussion today. Um, I am from Raleigh, North Carolina, uh, formerly uh, 
Saponi Indigenous Lands. Uh, I am an environmental liberator, content creator, storyteller. My full-time work is like field organizing for climate justice. And so you're probably gonna hear me talk a lot about my work through an environmental lens because that is how I choose to show up in the world. Um, I was a former Ignite fellow, so super happy to be back. I'm currently running for city council in Raleigh and really excited to talk more about, you know, this lens that I work through and all of my experiences and just have a blast. So super excited, you guys. I love that, Mary. And what I feel like what we need to do is can we type the word power in the chat box? Because I don't know about y'all, but the way that I show up in the space is I give the people what they give me. Um, and so we want to feel that you're here with us today and that you're present because we came to pour into you. And I really appreciate Zaina and Mary taking time to be in this space with us today. And I, you know, just talking here, I realized I just never introduced myself. So I'm going to end these introductions with <laughs> introducing myself. Um, my name is Tierra, last name Stewart, and I serve as Ignite's um, Chief Program Officer. Prior to this role, I was Ignite, uh, Ignite's National Fellowship Program Director, and so Mary and I did spend a lot of time together, and I'm super excited to see your beautiful face and everything that you're doing in your community. Um, and you know, this is not about me, so I'm just going to leave it there. I'm right now visiting family in Columbus, Ohio, but based in Baltimore, which I'll be back September 29th. Not that you need that information. We're going to hop right into the questions. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. Um, so starting with you, Mary, um, what are the issues that are close to you currently? Um, so really, I've been focusing on envisioning alternative futures and creating transformative solutions for uh, Black Indigenous liberation as it relates to climate justice and women. Mm -hmm. I really believe that the key to um, environmental liberation comes at, you know, centering the people who are closest to the problem, closest to the power. So mm -hmm. that work becomes very intersectional. Um, and, you know, that's where I've been. It's a, it's a question of, you know, how are how am I situating myself to be a catalyst of change? Uh, how am I centering my community with safety and equity um, and care for each individual? Am I respecting the rights and liberties of all the people as well as the planet? Um, am I questioning if we can breathe freely? Am I understanding how I'm showing up and how we can address if we're breathing freely? And that question comes in so many contexts when you start to think about race, police brutality, environmental injustice. Um, so really fortunately, my work towards climate justice and environmental justice, um, like I said, comes intersectional. Uh, environmental liberation is racial justice and equity. Prison abolition is climate justice. Housing is an environmental justice issue. So it's also a human right issue. Um, I've been talking a lot about rest and how it's a radical form of resistance and self-care. Indigenous liberation, queer liberation, Afrofuturism, equity, it's like this really cool lens that I get to address a lot of different topics through. Um, so I've been really focusing on how, you know, where we're going with this with this new administration towards climate action and how that is a, a lens for recreating a society that is building back from the COVID pandemic. That's where I've been recently. So let me just pause for a second, because I feel like you said so much that I just I want to dig into a lot. <laughs> but really, let's start with just this Black Indigenous liberation. I want to start there because I think that's important when you say Indigenous origin of land. But when you put the word in the race Black in front of that and then you add liberation, can you tell us more about what that is? It's more like black comma indigenous liberation. So like two referent groups. Um, so when I'm talking about black liberation, I'm talking about economic justice, criminal justice reform, prison abolition. I'm talking about the fact that it's, we're four times more likely to have asthma and other pulmonary problems because we're living in areas that have high amounts of pollutions. How are we addressing like these built structural inequities and erad eradicating colonization? Um, and then we start to look at colonization and some of the, you know, the more harmful impacts of uh, what our white supremacist settler state, I hate to get a little radical on that, but just in how that shows up in policy and governance, you start to look at the indigenous populations where they face many of the same issues 
through the same sort of lens. So uh, the issue of police brutality, um, land back, respecting their rights. They have environmental justice issues that are running through their communities and disrespecting their like sacred lands that they've had. So if we're talking about, you know, visioning a new future and as a, uh, as a city council candidate, it's, uh, you know, it's more of a local level, but, you know, how are we creating a society that is creating care for each individual um, mm. with respect to their history, their legacy, and who they, and their personal autonomy, and so when you're saying liberation, you're talking about liberating people from the things that have oppressed them, and in this country, mm. it's tied to, like, racism and white supremacy and colonization mm -hmm. and the remnants of those things within our government. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for diving deep. Because I think this is an important lesson for everyone right now. When we use the word reform, when we use the words reimagine, what we're basically is trying to consider another way of oppression. But when you use the word liberation, when you use the word eradicate, when you use the word um, abolish, that means just not only disrupting the system, but getting a completely new way of doing things that eliminates the oppression thereof. And so I appreciate you <laughs> for digging deeper into that. And I really want us to be careful with the language that we use. And when we get into these political spaces, don't just pick up the rhetoric because a lot of that is very loaded. So I'll always dig a little deeper. Um, and so I, I actually, my next question for the both of you is start with Zaina. What does community mean to you and how does it show up in your leadership? Wow, that's a loaded question. Um, community means, I don't want to say accountability, protection, and family, but there was like the outer basis. And I think like with Mary Black, they're like the lens she looked through. So just to be one, I have a very spiritual, psychological lens. So I'm not going to shoot you all with like all the political jargon. So I do. Sorry if I disappoint you, but I think community is when you have that sense of connection and identification with your surrounding environment. And I think being from an inner city black neighborhood or community, because there's such a lack of resources, there's a lack of um, community. There's like, we live in the hood, but the word neighbor isn't there most of the time because a lot of it is like very cold and distant. There's not many grocery stores, there's liquor stores, there's no jobs unless they're like government uh, place centers in the actual neighborhood, no recreational centers. So growing up in the actual inner city environment, the lack of resources made me realize how there's a lack of community within the black community due to all these environmental factors around us. And so I've, I've built my work on the not the political external like law legislation of like less fight for change or fight for social justice, but why aren't my people showing up to the community meetings? Like why are my friends dropping out of high school? Like why am I succeeding? Like I'm I'm making good money and I'm I'm graduating and doing everything I need to do, but the majority of my family is still stuck somewhere they can't get out of. And so that really revealed to me how community just isn't only a location, but we have to actually contribute to it. And so like when I see businesses in my neighborhood, they're, or they're like Arabian or like uh, Asianatic owned or like white owned and the people in my neighborhood don't own the properties. And so like, it made me realize how this is so deep to the point that I need to redevelop the internal parts of my people so I'm very passionate about reconstructing the confidence and the internal emotional space of the Black woman. Like the Black woman is my first priority above all other things because I am a Black woman and I'm seeing like a lot of women struggle with their feminine energy in terms of like nurturing children, don't have the support to raise a household, don't know even how to tend to your own mental health or self-care. So I'm big on teaching women how to take care of those internal um, emotional parts. Whether it's me teaching them herbalism and people that don't know what herbalism is, it's just like a folk remedy. Like you use plants to invoke healing in the body, whether emotionally or physically. Um, I'm not a doctor. I can't cure you. So don't believe me on that part. But just building that cultural rapport, I've built my work on not just pushing for a big, bigger change, but making sure like I'm teaching people how to live a fulfilling life like there's more than just you going to work like you can work and create purpose but you can't have purpose without people so like when you look in your neighborhood you see a problem you're supposed to actually feel that so I have a very West African view of what community is like work builds purpose in you you look around you see something missing and you decide yourself I want to give that 
But the problem we're facing in America, America is we live in capitalism. So we we trust the one percent of business. Like you go to most small towns in the middle of nowhere, there's a Walmart, and Walmart per, like gives so much to people that there's no need to open up a hardware store or like a shoe fixing store or like whatever store. So what we're living in is a world that's sucking us out of community unbeknownstly, but giving us high pay to contribute. And so you see people that work all day and we don't feel the need to come out and socialize. People prefer not to socialize. And now we're in the age of COVID where it's like, I really don't want to socialize. And now we're feeling even more disconnected. So I base my work on building that connection by hosting whether virtual in-person community meetings or attending like this thing called the Sisters Center. I work close with this organization called Tendaya Family. And we meet every Wednesday as Black women and we discuss issues in our community and work close to amend these issues within our community. And the conversation is a nice. And one thing about working in corporate America, I've learned is we love the passive aggressive approach. Like even if there is a problem, you better act like there is no problem. And you can't be afraid to shake a table if you wanna make real change. And you can't be afraid to get kicked away from the table. So when it comes to community work, it's about protecting your people. And it's not a vague statement. It's about protecting your mom, your dad, your sister, your brother, your next door neighbor. And that's going to require for us as a culture to start forgiving each other. And a lot of us in our generation, we don't like our parents. We don't, we're angry at our parents most of the time. We don't like our friends. So it's like we're learning how to trust each other is what I do a lot of my work around. So I hope that was good for y'all. Thank you for that, Zaina. And I just want to leave y'all with um, one sentiment that really hit me. When it comes to community work, it's about protecting your people. That was powerful. Um, Mary? Um, so yeah, as a climate organizer and city council candidate, community is really at the cornerstone of the work that I do. Uh, community advocacy without community work is just pretty words and ideas. Uh, a lot of the current shift to environmentalism that I'm working to is like a shift back to collectivism and indigenous ways of knowing that values the sense of community and working together to, you know, build new societies and healthier societies. Um, so, uh, you know, a change is really always based through this lens of whatever like community it's coming out of or like how the diversity of it. And it's really, the greatness of the community is really determined by, you know, not only of the compassion of its people, but also how it treats the seemingly most insignificant things among them. So community through this lens really asks us to be an active participant in the creation of care, as well as a vocal critic um, towards injustice and harm. And Zaina talked about that a little bit, like you have to be active in the work that we are like, See, seeing what seeing what's going on and like understanding that you have to be a part of creating change within the community and I think that comes from like you know experiencing those things or being connected to those things so creating a sense of connection and knowing the role in the community that you're creating within that so personally my city council platform upholds the belief that together our community can thrive where thrive is an acronym that we're you know progressing trustworthy healing resilient intersectional visionary and engaged policy we can create better community care and equity for all of the residents um, with respect to all identities so um yeah yes I think that is. Thank you for that, Mary. You are just so you're you're so loaded and so much wealth and knowledge in you that I just want to pause and dig deeper into everything that you're saying. But can you tell us more about what community care and equity looks like? Yeah. So, um, we you know we, you have to. I, I, I think I have a story for this one. So uh, I realized, you know, some of the privilege that I've been afforded in my life and how that, you know, plays into my understanding of the world and how that also like can play into me being apathetic about certain things or not mm -hmm. understanding about certain things. And it's a constant battle about against that because it's no, you know, my existence isn't the existence for everybody. So if we're just talking about that through the lens of ableism, like my city's not very walkable. Uh, so how are people who, uh, you know, aren't able to get around, like normally, like with walking, quote unquote, and we don't really have really great integrated transportation systems for certain types of people. So like, how are we creating 
a community where everybody has exactly what they need. What they need. We talk about racial justice and equity. Justice is, you know, giving everybody the same thing and like saying we all, everybody has the same thing. That's what justice and equality is. But justice and equity is giving everybody what they need to be able to succeed. Um, and it might be more than other people are getting because they have different barriers in life that are impacting them. Um, whether it be like through ableism, through racism, through economic or educational ventures. Um, so are we paying our are we paying our workers a livable wage? Are we addressing the affordability of housing in our communities? Um, are we uh, t- talking about environmental justice issues as it's happening here with flooding or um, just just yeah. Mm-hmm. Hope- Hope that makes sense. Yeah, I appreciate that. And honestly, on the conversation of what community-centric leadership, but what I believe the true essence of leadership is, period, is literally what you all are embodying, exemplifying in your work right now, which is to love, serve, and protect the people. Um, And I think that if we're looking at political leadership in our country right now, a lot of people are representing people which they don't know or they're not even from the community that they're serving. And we wonder why people don't show up to vote. And when we say go vote, vote for who and vote for what? (laughs) What are these people doing for me? And so before we can tell the people to get out and vote, we need to give them something to vote for. And this is a part of the work and this is a part of why we're in this space today to try to uh, re-socialize what leadership actually looks like in practice, um, not just in theory. And Zaina and Mary, you are really embodying that right now. And so a lot of the young women who are on this call are currently um, college students. And so for you, Zaina, what do you know now that you wish you would have known when you graduated from college? Can you hear us, Dana? My you... screen froze. My internet oh, just came you're back. back. On. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. We've had a lot of technical difficulties. That's the world we're living in. Welcome back, Tar. <laughs> um, so the question for you, Zaina, considering what you know now, um, what do you think or what do you know now that you wish you would have known when you graduated from college? Education isn't, um, college education isn't going to be the, the main solution for the Black community. Um, I've realized it's a matter of, it's a, well, it's a big matter, but one of the main things I've realized is there's a lack of social acclimation of the Black people. Like, we're still living like we're in the 1980s on average. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lack of, I want to say a lack of internal knowledge. There's a lack of what it means to be of a people, connected with a people. Mm-hmm. Um, I've learned that as much as we'll progress financially, that we'll start, we'll keep slowly losing ourselves socially if we don't amend the problems of our actual past, and not just the slavery dynamic, but the the traumas of our family. Uh, we don't really talk and process those things when it comes to our community. So we're very cold in our neighborhood. We're very anti each other. And I think when we can have that honest conversation with ourselves on a more internal level, we can do better. And that's why most of my community work is in private black only spaces. Like my running group is with this organization called Black Running Organization. Mm-hmm. And it's centric to only black people because we have to learn how to connect with each other and be comfortable with each other. Um, we're very divided. And I've learned until we can like unite as a people first, before we go on the stage front, we'll always be easily to separate. And mm-hmm. this is not, um, I would say I'm more Pan-African because I don't believe that to identify as the same thing. But I think we also have to understand we're under the same uh, system and that we're all under the same problem. Mm-hmm. And until we can accept that and respect that with each other, we, it looks, we, we don't realize that we make a show out of ourselves on the social front. And so I want us to get out of the, the savior complex as a culture and start to realize that there is enough college degrees for us to, you know, get out of this. We have to work together to fix our economic situation. We have to work together to actually go to these people and be like, this is what we want and we require this or else, you know, but college made me realize it's just, it's not for social affairs. It's for economic growth. 
you know, it fits the system, it works. And so it, it reveals to me that it won't change that issue. But outside of that, I've learned that the world is much bigger than the Black community. And I got to meet a lot of different cultures and I learned from different cultures, especially a lot of East Asian cultures and how they unify and work together and protect their antiquity knowledge, whether it's health or religion. And it inspired me to get closer to my own people because I don't see my people in a lot of uh, non-Black spaces, you know? I don't see us doing good on average. We look horrible in the media a lot of times and we don't really like to acknowledge that, but seeing that a lot of other social groups had different problems, like it taught me how to respect the difference. And I feel like living in an age where we're taught to like drop ourselves for the whole, I think I admire a lot of more people now have a deeper appreciation for community work and how people can be very protective over the communities. Like Chinatown is gonna stay Chinatown, it's not gonna change. And like, I can admire that now that I went to college and learned why community is important, so. Thank you for that. And I think I really want to people to um, understand that race is a social construct and understanding the foundation of race in America um, before race even existed, there was black, brown, and red bondsmen who came together against the top percent and rebelled. And their way of maintaining control over the population was to create race in order to create division amongst the people. And so the same divide that you will see amongst a community, the anti-blackness is the same divide you'll see amongst any culture or community. And it's the same divide that they continue to perpetuate this rhetoric with people in general in America in order for us to not get on the same page. Because if we would, we would recognize that a lot of our issues are similar um, and they don't want us to recognize that in order to keep control over the population. And so when we're thinking about education in particular, that is an institution that was constructed out of capitalism. And so it's there and put in place in order to maintain a capitalistic society. What it teaches you is self-achievement. It teaches you all, everything is self-driven, my own accomplishments, my own image, and it derives from self-achievement rooted in capitalism, which give, gets us further and further away from the meaning and the true essence of community and how to go back and pour into your community and not this idea of like, I gotta get out of, I gotta get out of the hood, I gotta get out. And really we should be keeping our knowledge and all of our resources within our community in order to continue to grow. And I think um, a lot of that is what you uh, talked to Zaina. So I appreciate you for bringing that up. But once we recognize the power and the collectiveness of our human, then will we see the pour over in our communities and not just not black or white, insert race here, I'm talking about the people in general, the collective people, um, but that's neither here nor there. I wanted to see, uh, Mary, did you want to um, add anything to this? Uh, the question being, um, what do you know now <laughs> that you wish you have known when you graduated from college? Yeah, um, I actually would like to, I've been reflecting on this a lot. Um, so there's probably three distinct things that I would say. The first thing is I wish I would have granted myself more grace and flexibility. Um, I've realized this recently that I was putting all of these expectations on myself that I put on myself before I was even, I was like 17, 16, and I was putting all of these expectations and things on myself that for somebody that's like 22 now, completely different person, completely different outlook on life, still wanting some of the same things, but I was just going after the idea that I had created for myself when I was a teenager, and I ran into a lot of walls along the way, um, and a lot of anxiety around it, because I just, I just wish I'd been, like, less anxious, like, granted myself more flexibility in the understanding and the idea of growing up, and now that I'm a little bit older, I'm, like, 27, I'm less anxious about getting older, still a little bit anxious, but just less anxious about it, because I have more of an understanding that, you know, life never stops being life, adulting never stops adulting, but you just get better at it. Um, the challenges and the expectations and the ebbs and flows of life. Um, and I feel a lot more confident in that. And I just wish I would have allowed myself to grow into that confidence more instead of just expecting so much of myself at 22. Um, the second thing 
is that I wish I had a better understanding of my role um, within social and community change. There's this like nexus of social ecosystems um, and they have like, you know, it's a couple different categories I have it pulled up. They have weavers, experimenters, uh, healers, disruptors, caregivers, builders, visionaries, storytellers, frontline responders. So like, I wish I had more of an understanding of what role I really played within this social change and the ecosystem that I wanted to work in. I knew when I graduated that I wanted to do social change, policy, community work, environmental work, but I didn't know exactly how I wanted to show up in that space. And I spent a lot of time just like trying to figure myself out. So, um, I had a better understanding of my role and you know brought more power in, into it and the second thing I wish I had known is that I was that girl like I was I was I was the one and not the two <laughs> not the three and you kind of have to manifest that for yourself or you know just bring it into your life for yourself but um you know if you allow the world to invalidate you it will mm -hmm. I, I hate that it's the case that you know Sometimes it, when you're walking into spaces and they won't see past the color of your skin or your gender or how much money you make or what school you went to or whatever. Um, and so if you allow those things to like the, the reality of those things to come into your life and you really internalize that, it makes it harder to bring power into who you are as a person. So when I started to do that and really focus on knowing who I was uniquely and what I could bring and gr bringing power into the things that I, my role as a person, the world has opened up for me, literally. Um, it's been really amazing. So I just wish I had those three things. And mm. that is all. Thank you for that, um, Mary. And as you were speaking, it just reminded me of something that I read. I forgot the name of the book, but it said our inner voice is both insecure and arrogant. And I think we just let those voices in our head chatter way too much. <laughs> and then, like you said, become a manifestation. And, you know, between all the different societal constructs and just measuring ourselves up to things that are moving around us, it starts to become overwhelming. And I, I really hope, like, thinking about where you are now and where you're going to be a couple years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now. Um, what I would like to leave y'all with is it's not about where you are, what you're doing, or even how you're doing it. It's truly just about the impact that you're having on people's lives. And so I let go of this idea of what is success is supposed to look like and um, any accolades or any awards and any of those different things. It does not matter what I'm doing as long as I'm, as long as, as I'm having an impact on humanity. And that can look like so many different things. And I truly believe this, I'm gonna pull up the Bible when it said to go into all of the world and that will look like many different things and we will wear many different hats and we will craft many different things and that's perfectly okay. And then if you only do one thing, that's okay. But don't be trying to figure out all these different things. Like I have to do this by this time and take away the idea of time, get into the business of the moment or you gonna miss the purpose of your life. Um, I want to ask you both one last question before we wrap up our panel today. Um, let's see, actually, let's end with this question. Um, just a last piece of advice to the people in this room. What has helped you get where you are? And what advice would you have for the young women in this room who want to head in a similar direction as it relates to community centric leadership? I think what helped me get here, there was no doors that opened for me for a long time. Mm. Like in 2018, I, I thought I could get the job I wanted when I wanted. I thought the world would fall to my feet because I, I went to school and everything worked out. And then when no door opened for me, I realized I had to make my own door. And I realized the way I want people to feel wasn't the way that society is going. And I'm very, I'm very big on creating from inside myself. And so when no opportunity opened up when I first moved to Baltimore, I think I worked at a Alito's pizza shop and I was so ashamed of myself. And it goes back to your statement about uh, 
uh, did you say insecurity is the opposite of arrogance? Um, that inner voice is both insecure and arrogant. <laughs> and it's crazy you say that because at that point I was very arrogant in my journey because I just knew everything would work out because everything always worked out. Not realize the only reason why everything works out is because I'm processing through a system my whole life. Like, of course, everything is going to work out. Like, school is an institution. There's steps that's going to push you through no matter what. And the real world isn't like that. The real world is very ambiguous. And you won't have to figure out on your own by yourself. And you can go back to a system, whether it's working a government job and growing up the ladder and uh, retiring. But that was that was for me. And it took me a while to realize, like, okay. The opposite of pride is shame. So if things don't work out and you're not really on your top gun, you want to feel ashamed of yourself. Like, how could I? And when I realized I have to let that thing go all together and just figure it out and create it. Like, well, if nobody want to hire me and I want to do mental health work, create a podcast. Create a podcast. Like, oh, well, you love herbs. Like, you love medicines. And there's a community meeting. Show up. So I would show up. I didn't have friends. And then I started going out in my local neighborhood and I started meeting all this, the people in my community. And then I developed an actual network of people. And it revealed to me, like, this is the way. Like, I thought I wanted to go, like, apply for jobs on Indeed. Like, that's how I'm going to get into my work. But it was really when all the doors were closed and I got close to my people in my local neighborhood. And I saw, like, wait a minute, like, we hold each other up arms and arms. We don't, you don't climb nowhere. You walk with people. And so if if all the doors didn't close me, and I, it wasn't racial because everywhere I applied, most people on the team were black people. So I know it wasn't racial. It was just a matter of maybe they didn't want me, but I had to want me. And I had to let people know what I do. And then once I built that relationship, everything happened. Like, oh, well, we love that you're an herbalist. We need you. Like, my child is sick. Can you help us? Or can I work with you? So now can you, I teach people. But I had to do the background work. I had to be up for hours sometimes building a website, building a curriculum, going to volunteer events and trying to make my job donate food to like food drives. But it's like, you don't, you have to get so thick in it that even if, you can't get paid for it. You want to do it because you know it must be done. But that's how I, I arrived. It was just, when you got no choice. What you going to do? You want to just sit back? And COVID revealed that to me. When COVID happened, the world got scared, shut down. The whole world got quiet. I was part of a group of people that actually went out and delivered groceries to people. You know, we was out in the middle of the morning passing out bags of groceries, trying to make sure Black people ate because Black people can't really afford to not go to work. Like, you go to work and you don't, you're on your curb, basically. So it's like, we had to take care of each other during that time and, like, keep each other going. It's like, the work don't stop. But that's how I arrived. Thank you, Zaina. And I just want y'all to hear what she said in, in regards to if that door isn't there, create your own door. And I want to take it one step further because um, one of the things that Black women taught me about leadership is that we lift as we climb. And so when you create a door for yourself, you create a revolving door so that somebody can come in behind you. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, what about you, Mary? Um, I just want to say, Zena, a lot of that really resonated with me. I think we have very similar experiences. Uh, it's really the case that, you know, you can't be afraid to make your own table. Uh, to stop always having to ask people for to a seat at their table. I had the experience where, you know, it took me four years to get a job in the environmental field. And I felt like I was qualified. I was passionate. And, you know, for me, I really think it was race. Um, actually, that's been sort of confirmed in the time since then, like literally the other day I had a conversation about somebody who is over an environmental organization here in North Carolina that was meaningfully keeping a lot of color mm -hmm. out of employment at that organization, um, like strategically doing that. And it explained a lot. And I had to, you know, I ended up creating an organization specifically about addressing the internship to job pipeline for you know college students and young people who are interested in environmental and climate work um, and creating advocacy and work programs around that so it's definitely important to understand that you know there is more than one way to do the work um, it's not always like this one path that has been laid out and they tell you is what you need to do and this is this is what you need to do in this sequence um, there's you know you're hopping to different 
parts and different stones all the time and just remain flexible in that. Uh, mm -hmm. What was the other thing? There was one other thing. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I guess that, that would be like the main point. Uh, just understand that, you know, there's more than one way to do something and you have the power and the flexibility to be able to create that for yourself and for and for the community that you work in um yeah and under understand the people that you're working around because some like if you have an issue that you feel passionately about there's probably somebody else that can like build you can build power with like if you want to go fast go alone but if you want to go far go together so there's definitely understanding of like bringing that into the work that you're doing and mm -hmm. yeah uh, I just love everything that y'all are saying. This piece, Mary, that you said, understand that there's other people around and similar purpose that you can build power with. And I think it's stronger together than individual effort. Um, I just want, I, I think there's one question in the chat box that we're going to end with. Um, and I just want to share that the journey of leadership is extremely learned, lonely. Um, and it can be very, for the lack of a better way to say it, hard. <laughs> and I mean, you can have blow after blow. Um, the same people sometimes that you may be even serving might be behind some of those blows. Um, lack of recognition or validation for the work. Not only is it lonely, you don't really get paid or the credit for the work that you're doing. And so we don't do this work because we want to do the work necessarily. We do it because we have to do it. Somebody has to do it. Someone has to pass the baton. Someone has to prioritize this because the future of our people depends on it. And I say that to say that y'all are going to have to establish what I like to call like a sister circle, which is someone that you can lean on during that very lonely journey, because there's going to be multiple times when you question, is this even worth it? Am I making impact? Am I doing the right thing? Why am I doing this? There's going to be so many times when you get into that state of despair, it's going to take some people to be a mirror, reflect your greatness and your power. And so be very careful on how you carry your sister circle or your people, your folk circle, whatever you want to call it. Um, but people who can be a mirror and reflect that greatness. And I say that to also be careful of who you have in there, because if they ain't reflecting greatness, then what they reflect in. Um, and so the last question that we're going to leave with, and thank you, Carolyn, for asking this, is what moment, and if you could just spend um, one minute or two, what was that moment for you? Oh, wait, there's more than anybody. I've often described myself as a career volunteer for folks feeling burnt out from being, uh, that's such a great question. Okay. <laughs> All right. So Jess, we're going to go with this question. Any advice for folks feeling burnt out from being underpaid or unpaid? My advice would be, while you're doing that, learn as much as you can while you're there. And I would say, in the beginning, over assume leadership just so you can expand your like resume. And then when you get like at least to that six months or year mark, just start looking again. But if you already have that work or that network where you're doing that, I would say learn how to network better. Because at this point, you are the skill. Like you are, you carry the gift at that point. Like you, if you learn how to, I don't want to say be more creative, but like if you learn how to use that work that you're doing for the company and you're really passionate about it and take the initiative to do it yourself. Like say you, you're a bartender and you bartend at a local restaurant and you don't make much money, but you have the skill and you're passionate about it. You can go get like, you know, your, your license to be like a vendor. You could do events you can do a website mm -hmm. it's like that skill applies to all things like put the power in yourself if you don't want somebody to constantly have to keep paying you maybe become a contractor for companies and negotiate like learn how to negotiate yourself into things or if you want to go to freelance out you can there's many ways but this is more like a, a fear of stepping in your power like you have to learn how to step into your power stop applying for jobs that you can see they're not paying much 
And it took me a while to like learn how to skip over that. Like believe in yourself to the point where you can say, I like what they're doing, but they only pay 30. And I need a minimum of 50 to live. So do that. Stop putting yourself in a small boat when you know you need to go first. Mm, mm. Thank you. Thank you, Zaina. Mary? Um, so you know how on your resume you're supposed to use like active, like describing words like facilitated, supervised, led. Um, take that sort of lens and apply it to the volunteer work. Uh, so whatever you're doing, like you're not just shuffling papers. No, you're like facilitating like paperwork and like get the most out of the experience. And like Xana was saying, like it's so important to networking and networking isn't always like, oh, I would like to do this and I would like to do that. Like it's just really creating interpersonal relationships with people who may be able to help you along the way or like can, you know, guide you or mentor you or like influence you in some way towards some other greater work. Um, and yeah, also, so burnout is something that is so real, especially if you're doing like social nonprofit community work. So I would take, I would say like back to this rest is radical point, like make sure you're not take time for yourself. Do not allow these organizations to run you like, <laughs> like into mm -hmm. the ground. Um, you taking care of the planet and people is just important is, isn't, just not a, is, it, is as important, if not more important, than taking care of yourself. Mm -hmm. um, you cannot show up to do the work if you have not taken care of yourself. Um, so that is the mental, the social. And, you know, we always talk about this idea of like what self-care is and what that looks like. It looks different for everybody. For me, I like to hike and like just be in green spaces and just enjoy time in the sun and relax. Um, it, it could be different for everybody else. So just make sure, make sure you're prioritizing time for yourself um, so that you're combating burnout and like, you know, you're surrounding yourself with happiness and with good positive vibes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, absolutely. And I think that we are always advocates of everyone else that we forget to advocate for ourselves or we find it hard to speak on our own behalf. And so it's, I have a question for y'all. What are you doing to advocate for yourself? When you get that job offer, you just settle in for the first offer. You're going to negotiate something higher. Are you asking for what you actually want? And are you prepared to turn it down when it doesn't meet the needs of your expectation? I think it's literally about learning self-advocacy, not only with in world, but also within work environment, if you're dependent on somebody to cut you a check every month, they're also dependent on you for your skills, your capabilities, and what you do to drive the work forward. And so you're not a slave. <laughs> um, and you're not a service. So ask for what you want and also be prepared to walk away if you have to, um, because we're not slaves. So and I just want to say thank you, Mary and Zaina. This has been such a joy to be in this space with you. And I really hope everyone got something out of this. If y'all could just type the word community in the chat box, because that's really what this conversation was centered in. Um, what does it mean to show up on behalf of community, with community, for community, in order to push community back to the forefront of leadership? That's what it's all about. Um, and I just want to say thank y'all uh, for spending this time with us this day. And I, I really hope that whatever y'all about to do next is something for yourself. Because <laughs> I know once we click out of this virtual event, I'm doing something for myself. <laughs> I'm going to pass the baton back over to Tari, who had a little bit of technical issues earlier. Um, but we missed hearing your voice and I'm going to be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> You are hilarious. No, thank you. Thank you, Tierra Stewart, for being our moderator for that panel. And thank you, wonderful women of color doing big things, giving the best advice as possible for our young leaders to be. So make sure that you guys were taking notes, take a few moments, take a little break. Um, but you know what? Before we go from this, I need y'all to show some love show some love. We talked about community. So give me a heart. Give me two claps. Give me clap, clap, clap for our speakers doing big things. Talking about building. Yes. Clapping heart, heart clap. Hey, hey, hey. Get fired up. They got me fired up. I had to turn the camera off because a tear came down my eye. <laughs> because like it's so real. And we're in a space in leadership like trying to teach you guys, man, these are the things that we wish we would have known when we were in your shoes. When we were 18, when we were 17, when we were 19, when we were 21, man, I wish I had this toolkit available to me. 
and it's for the free 99. The game is served up for y'all for free because these women have lived it. We have lived it. So we're here to make sure that you guys build the bridges, build community, build relationships, build the door. Don't knock down even the door. Build that door that's going to take you guys to that next level, right? Because that's what it's all about. Protecting, serving, loving, supporting community, community centric, y'all. Okay. So we're going to go right into our next slides. And y'all, I'm on my phone now. So <laughs> just letting you know, going to be a little bit different because of my view. Like, are getting fire, fire up. Is the next slide up? One second. Okay. No, I just didn't know if I didn't see it. Um, and while we get that slide up, get off of mute. Anybody had a hand up? Anybody wanted to talk about what they learned from that experience from the panel? For a few seconds. Any hands up? Any hands up? So, uh, uh, to my heart and not my head. Know that I love and respect you. So, be sure it's a really great, super, super. Yeah, Carolyn's hand is up. Today, but yeah. 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 So, something that I really gained from that conversation was that community isn't just a place. And this was said a little bit earlier on, but it was really like, affirmed and everything that they were saying is that community isn't just a place it's a thing that you're a part of it's something that you have like a duty to almost like you know in in Dallas I get to reap all the benefits of like living in Dallas but like am I am I giving that back am I talking to the people around me am I building relationships with people so that if they're in trouble they can come to me and vice versa and I think that also goes into being a leader is that you know what's going on in your community because you know the people in the community, not just that you know where people are. Yes, Carly, yes. And that leads right into what community leadership, community-centric leadership is what this baby should say. Um, and that's those five steps. What did Carolyn just say? You got to figure out who is your community. I put in the chat earlier, who's your tribe? Find your tribe. Figure out who those folks are. You're going to identify those folks with and systems, identifying people and systems in your community. Two, name what you want to change in your community. Carolyn said it best. Jess said it best. Barbara even got in there and said it best. <laughs> What is it that you want to change? Is it education? Is it health disparities? Is it recruitment processes and employment? Is it that you want to create a pipeline for whatever it is, a pipeline for lawyers, a pipeline for doctors, a pipeline for politicians, right? Three, what did our panel say? Get involved. Don't just say I did, I was a part of Dick Durbin's um, area, or I was a part of Corey Bush's team. We don't care about being a part of, we want you actively involved in the process. And that is what's gonna help you learn and grow and evolve into the leader of tomorrow. Once you got involved, I need y'all to find you a mentor. I need you to not only find one mentor, I need y'all to find like, 65 minutes. <laughs> Meaning that a lot of times we come into this uh, walk of life and we think that we're only supposed to have that one mentor and they're going to do and give you and embrace you with all this knowledge. That ain't the case, baby. We need mentors from all walks of life. We need mentors that are educational. We need mentors that are giving us the hands-on experiences. We need mentors that are the ones with that bag, right? Find a mentor with all that money, all that money, and they doing great things. 
find the ones with all that money and they doing bad things because you might be the person that can advocate for that person to go towards some of the movement that you found move towards more about how to get involved in the different community changes that you want to see in that community that you have identified right and so i always say find a five minute mentor just that person that you're going to talk to for five minutes check in um get some advice find a mentor that's going to be your champion when it is just, I don't know what I'm going to do. What am I going to do? The Lord, 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 you're praying to the guys, baby. You're praying to the guys you don't know what to do. Find that mentor that's going to be your champion. That's going to say, hey, Tari, it's going to be okay. Like, all you need to do is A, B, and C. You can be so upset for five minutes, but get over it because we got to get into action, get into gear because it's a movement and we have a community to focus on, right? And then find you that mentor that, hey, is in some business already. They are the ones that can connect you with that internship. They are the ones that can be at the golf tournament and they're like, hmm, uh, one of my uh, fellows, or one of my mentees who's at Texas A&M or at Clark University <laughs> um, is interested in this movement. Hey, would you mind like meeting with them, having lunch? Um, all that good stuff. Like you guys have opportunities out there. You, I see there's some connections in the chat. You got two potential mentors, three even with Tierra Stewart at your fingertips that you can now say that you can connect with. You can now say who they are, what they're about, and if they would be great mentors because you heard their story and you heard their missing pieces. And because those little pieces were missing with them, things like having a supportive system, they're gonna be that for you. And that's what you need in a champion. And then once you've done all that, get others to join your movement. It starts today just by you being a part of the panel, just by you participating, hearing all this organizational tips, just by you now hearing these five steps on how to be community centered. Community centered equals community centric leadership. Get others involved. So your five steps, identify who is your community, who is your tribe, name what you want to change, what is the movement. Three, get involved. Four, find you some mentors, some champions, and then five, get others to join you. Folks on your college campuses, mama, sister, cousin, um, your pen pals, I don't know. <laughs> get on TikTok and tell everybody about what you're doing, why you're doing and how you can get involved. Little simple things make a huge step in the movement. And these are all things that are gonna help you get qualified as leaders for your next steps, whether that is eboard at your colleges or community colleges all that good stuff so in the chat box who is your community what cultures are you a part of that's what i like to say to make it uh, even easier what cultures do you want to serve is it african-american is it east asian is it um mexican is it women? Is it children? Is it the queer? Is it animals? Like, to be honest, like, is it the environment? Are there any of those areas that show this is your, this is my community? College students, young, elders, who is your community? Community colleges, first gen, Pacific Islanders, Asian, GLBTQAIA, women. Oh, we, she has narrowed it down. Thank you, Miss Good. Women in Iowa City, politically active women, young women, young people, young Black people, Black people, Columbus. Hey. <laughs> That's who my community is. Low-income minorities, we got that. That is awesome. 
these are all areas that are your community. I see college students, young queer people. Like, so therefore, so many areas. Ooh, when you find your community, what do you find? Power. You find power. And so identifying your community is the key to understanding your role in the community. Starting from who your people are allows you to create better opportunities than you ever could for authentically engage and lead your community. What I talked about a little bit earlier, toolbox. And the first piece in the toolkit is identifying who that community is. Because there's what? There's power, baby. There's power in the community. There is so much power in the community. Next slide. Now we're going to break out for about five minutes. What do you want to change in your community? I leaned in earlier asking that question of you guys. We did not have a lot of time, but you're going to be set up in some breakouts. You want to meet and greet and discuss what do you want to change? And while you're doing that, remember that Carolyn put in the chat box some check-in. So click on those links so that you can check in. Tell us who you are. Where are you from? Get that $25, y'all. Okay. Has everyone been sent to a breakout? Yep, I have. Everyone should be um, should be popping up on folks' screen. Oh, I need to move Mary. I mean, uh, Jesse. Okay. Two, two, two. There we go. Thanks. I just saw like seven, so I was like, wait a minute, are there still people here? Yeah. I'm just making sure no one. Um... Okay, it's just us and Jess. <laughs> Jesse, did you get an invite? I did, but it, it took me back. Let me see if it's in my breakout rooms. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I got it again. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Morning or afternoon or evening, Jess. <laughs> One of them. Sorry, I can't um see you when the slides are up, so I'm going based off your voice about when you want me to move forward. <laughs> Like when I sit here, you like tamper. Ah, I was like, <laughs> I'll just keep talking. <laughs> yeah, I'm doing behind the scenes. Uh, I'm doing behind the scenes productive. I mean, production management. <laughs> like, you right. really are. And what was the off the speaker off the microphone? <laughs> um, Shay it is. By the way, welcome. It's nice. To Hi. Hi. Sorry, I'm actually. I'm on panels. I've already been on a panel and I'm in a break to go back onto another panel. So you, if you hear them in the background, it's because it's not my turn to speak yet. <laughs> oh, well, girl, why don't you just go to your other thing? You right. came to see my fellows and I sent them messages to make sure they see that I see them. They see me. I see them. They see me. Accountability. That's right. Hey, you know what? Look, I got to show up sometimes. And uh, anyway, don't. Uh, don't go to the breakout. Oh, yeah, I'll pause the recording. I want you all to know your tribe includes all of us good people throughout the region. Who would have known? Because you were here today. You were able to meet folks from Cali, from Baltimore area, Chi-Town, ATL, all on one call. So we're talking about community leadership, community-centric, baby. Leadership, identifying the issues. Identify what you care about, right, in that community. We talked about this, y'all. Thank you, Shay, for adding your um, email and IG. But 
when we are doing this, I want you guys to remember, do the research. Two, pinpoint where you can start and work up the ladder. Team up, team up, grab a, a tribe. It's all about creating relationships for you guys to do big, great things. Don't go at it alone. When it's a team, teamwork makes a dream work. It also builds that sense of community to where you have someone that you can fall on. I hate to say fall back on, fall on, because we're moving forward, right, y'all? And then when all else fails, just do what? Just show up. These are some of the things that I wish I would have known, not just dealing with community leadership, but just being a leadership in general, especially number four, when all else fails, just show up. Because guess what, y'all? The universe has presented you with a toolkit, everything that you need to grow, to learn, and to get to the next place. Oh, man, y'all. This has been a day of what learning about how to get involved and be involved. So reflect. Take a minute. What is one way you can become involved in your community? Put it in the chat box, people. We're chatting. Hit me up there. Hit us up there. Because we got to get involved. We got to make a difference. No one is doing this work. This work can be highlighted. This work can be changed. You can change communities because of what? One way for you all to be involved in the community. You can just show up. You got the skills. Getting out there, meeting people. Guess what? I'm glad someone said that. Getting out there and meeting people don't mean you even got to get out your house, your dorm. You got to go nowhere. Email, Zoom, Slack them, Twitter. You got all that at your fingertips. Other ways. I see getting certifications. What, Nicole? Hit that. Yes. Make sure we're getting people registered to vote in the community. Go into those events. Easy breezy. Someone said they just joined community builders group at the university. Yes, yes, yes. Maintaining relationships through one-on-one, -on -one, sharing resources. That's what it's all about. Community leadership, how you can get involved. So many ways. So what we want you to do is run for office, that can be your e-board, that can be student government, it can be state government, school boards, et cetera. We want people applying for the board, people applying for the commission. We want volunteers for the local community organizations, whatever community organization is close to your heart. We want you guys to work for an elected official. The Honorable Shea is a great person and a great resource for you all and many other fellows who have done that work and myself who has done that work working for elected officials. It's a good time. It's hard. It's hard, but it's the learning process. We want you to work as campaign staff, right? We want you to be a part of that process. Then we talked about you all finding a mentor. This asks, do you have a mentor? If you don't, go get one. And they can help in so many ways that we talked about before. Next slide. Back to when you get that mentor, ask. Mentor relationships are mutually beneficial. Touch my heart when I'm working with students um, and building and growing with them because I have relationships with students that I know when they were in the pipeline at eight years old and now they've graduated and I still have relationships with them. So know that that is real. And then we talked about letting others join. It's all about, you guys got your five steps, five, 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 five steps. Um, like real talk, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. It is not, 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 not a sprint. This is a marathon and we will continue to pass the torch. There will be folks that are running real fast and there are some that might be walking. 
it might be somebody that I got to drag, okay? But we're going to get to the finish line. As we talked about in that panel, Miss Gara really knocked this in when she said, reflect on if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And that's what it's all about. Hey, <laughs> like really, that's what it's all about. Next slide. In the words of Ella Baker, we are not leaderless movement. We are a leaderful, fall, y'all, we're leaderful. This is a leaderful moment because you guys are full of so much support. You guys are full of so many experiences. You guys are full of heart and passion for this movement. And we want you guys to invite others to our event and to your event. We want you guys to share opportunities. And we also want you to serve as a mentor and a resource to others. Let's get these folks at the table so that we can create this call of action, create a space that we continue to hone in on our leadership skills. How you can do that is attending our upcoming national college event. We got power to the people, y'all. So that focus is police violence in America. That is on November the 13th. Then we have legislative advocacy. Activate your activism. Some of the things that the women on the panel were talking about today, living it, being it, um, be a part of the movement. Then we have voter suppression and mobilization in your community conversation. That is in April from next year. And then we have our State of the Union. I am just letting you know. These are activities you can be a part of or that you will be a part of because now you're a part of the movement and we got you fired up, right? These are activities that you guys can share out. It is an Ignite thing. Get fired up, y'all. It's Ignite National. We want you guys to find us on Instagram. As my little child says, TikTok, TikTok, get us. Find us on TikTok. Get on Twitter. We're on Facebook. And we got the dopest website ever. So find us online. Our website is below. I want to thank you guys for participating in such a great event. You got me so fired up. I don't know what to do with myself. <laughs> like, I'm just going to go out. I need to go meet with the right, right, I just did so much I want to say and do right now. I got fired up. So what? how do you guys feel? Do you guys feel like, oh, my God, this is just so much? Share in the chat box your number and a sentence about why. How excited are you to define your call to service or take action now? I want y'all to be like, ain't no stopping me now. <laughs> I want y'all to add five. But if you are in the middle, if you're like, yeah, I don't know, we're here to serve up the tools so that you feel good, that you know what to do, how to do it. We're giving you the toolkit so that you guys are what? community-centric leaders for the movement for tomorrow. And that is all we have today. Thank you again. We are the leaders. We, you, you, because we, I'm already here, I'm old school. You are the leaders that I have been waiting on and that Sierra has been waiting on, and that uh, Mary has been waiting on, and Zayna has been waiting on. <laughs> because real talk, you guys are here. We have the torch and we're ready to pass it to you guys. You guys are the next step in the movement. Thank you guys. Get on our website, find us on social media, get involved. It's about you guys. Drop in the chat your social media handles. I am, we love t Trek one <laughs> We love t Trek one Find me on Instagram. Look me up on Facebook. And that's the same for who our new tribe of Ignite leaders in the National College Chapter group, right? You guys, the next leader, you are the future. Thank you guys so much. Have a good rest of the day.
Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to stay back for just a few moments. So if anyone wants to uh, ask some questions or have concerns, go ahead and stick around for about five minutes. Thank you. Yes, I hope you guys do. Thank you, Carolyn, for sharing that. Get connected, stay connected with us. We're your <laughs> tribe, we're here to support you. Thank you, guys. Okay, I put the P okay. one, two, three in, um, let me stop.